That was uh, fantastic. Uh, we're, we're very lucky to have uh, Representative Schweikert, Representative Polis uh, on the Blockchain Caucus uh, representing uh, a lot of the interests of this, uh, of this industry. Um, speaking firsthand, b being in um, probably 20 uh, members of Congress uh, offices over the last uh, few years, uh, there's folks that get it. Uh, clearly, uh, these two gentlemen get it. And then, um, you know, you kind of go in these uh, uh, offices and you say, you know, the, the uh, beauty of Bitcoin and this underlying railroad of blockchain, and you really talk about, you know, how this is going to change every industry, et cetera. And you kind of go through this, and then at the end of the meeting, the, the, the member would be like, well, what do you want? It's like, no, 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 we, we want nothing. We just want you to know this is coming down the uh, path here. And uh, we're, we're dealing with uh, a new element, a new medium here that's li literally gonna light up every uh, agency, every uh, part of, uh, of the zip code of DC uh, because we're dealing with, with money, digital identity, and, and lots of different uh, fabrics of, uh, of movement, of value, and data. So it'll be interesting to see how that uh, continues to play out. And, and we need strong advocates like, uh, like we saw here today. Uh, up next, um, I'm uh, pleased to uh, introduce our, our next speaker, our uh, first keynote speaker of the day, uh, David Treat uh, from Accenture. Uh, David's had a long um, career in uh, consulting, a strategist in financial services. Uh, David runs uh, the blockchain effort at, uh, at Accenture, uh, one of the largest uh, IT consulting uh, firms on the planet. Um, and I'm a big believer in, in actions speak louder than words. And, and uh, David's a man of action. Uh, he uh, uh, is a contributor and member of uh, uh, Hyperledger, of the Ethereum, uh, Enterprise Ethereum Association, um, and is also uh, the, uh, the, the thought leader and the sponsor of uh, the title sponsorship here of, uh, of the chamber, which uh, we're very uh, thankful for. And, um, a uh, uh, pleasure to introduce uh, David.
So before I try to convince you I haven't lost my mind by playing this video, <laughs> um, I just want uh, to reflect a little bit on, on what we heard uh, in the panel just now. Uh, yesterday, uh, I think, uh, I, Matt, I love that you pulled the audience to get the different perspectives that we have in the room because uh, the thing that I get asked most often um, in media interviews, and I think a lot of the questions that we heard yesterday uh, and we heard just now, you know, this notion of um, where are we? What's the state of this technology? What are the challenges that we have to address to be able to uh, take it into, re you know, make it reality, make it real, take it into production? Um, what, what are those regulatory and policy and funding and, and uh, you know, the, the whole notion of, um, you know, as uh, I think it was uh, Representative Schweikert said, you know, those, those that stand to potentially have the value that they create today changed and, dis and disturbed, disturbed and uh, you know, all of these questions, one of the things that's missing for me uh, is we've got this, these questions, this, you know, understanding of the current state of play. And then in the room, you know, those of you, that, you know, those of us that raised our hands around our excitement and vision for what we're, what we're building with this technology, what it can do, Charles's talk, where'd he go? Charles left, on uh, the financial, financial inclusion. Um, the, the gap between those two of, you know, all the questions, enormous, fantastic vision as to where we need to be. Um, there's a gap for me around understanding the state of play of where we are today and helping to, to articulate that. So I have two goals for this morning. One is, I'll explain the video, <laughs> um, and uh, share a perspective on uh, where we are at the state of play within black blockchain technology. And then the second is introduce a piece of work that we have launched and an, an, an invitation actually to all of you to join with us in creating a frame of reference by which we can articulate the state of play for blockchain technology. Because through that articulation and having a clear understanding of what has been developed already, that gap to the vision for what we all think and hope and, and things we haven't even thought of yet as to what it could achieve, if we're able to articulate, articulate that, it will help enormously. So let me try to explain my insanity. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is 1954. Uh, these two gentlemen are, are looking at the field as they started plowing the ground uh, to build the CERN facility. Uh, and at that point in time, the compute power they were able to calculate as to the data that was going to come off of those first collisions, based on the compute power of the day, it was going to take 13.2 billion years to analyze one experiment. But they still broke ground. <laughs> 22, uh, sorry, at that point it was 12, 11, 12. 12 nations got together as the initial consortium. You're going to start to hear some familiar words. Uh, consortium got together and said, we're going to do this. Start, the idea was in 1949, broke ground in 1954. In 1959, they, they, they had the, uh, the, you know, the first synchrotron uh, load up. Fast forward uh, you know, another dozen years. The first proton collisions, at that point, the, the technology of the time, it was going to take 65 million years, based on the compute power, to analyze that first reaction. And yet, they still went forward. By this time, or roughly this time, I'm going to get some of my facts wrong, so apologize to the CERN team. Um, up to 22 nations. The consortium has now grown. The, bre the ground that they broke split between Switzerland and France. We had it crossing a boundary and a border. In 1988, they built the tunnel for the first, uh, the, the piece in the video that you saw where they pre-accelerate the protons. 3.2 million years. 1997, 11,000 years. 2006, still at 35 years to analyze the data that was going to come off of this and the billions of dollars that were being invested in, in constructing what is the world's largest machine. And then 2015, when they actually, 2012 was the Nobel Prize and the discovery, 2015, uh, the announcement of Pentaquarks, they got it down to one year. And that was massive success. But through this entire journey, it was never about what can the technology do today? It was, we've got a vision for what we're trying to discover and create and solve. The technology will get there. It's, it's an you know, innovation, it's a design, it's a configuration problem. Let's not be encumbered by what the technology can do today. There's an alternative story. It's not so good for us. <laughs> so here in the US, we tried to build the super, super conducting super collider. 
Uh, I'm going to tell the story very shortly as, a, as you know, a different kind of lesson. This was a single nation's effort. Uh, this uh, is the hole that they dug uh, in Texas uh, to start to build what was going to be something three times the size of what was done in CERN. For a variety of reasons, uh, uh, in terms of single people going it alone, jumping straight to a massive answer and not iterating to it, funding challenges, there's a whole long story you can read up on. That facility is now a chemical blending plant um, <laughs> in 2012. They filled that hole with water for a decade, uh, and it's now um, being productively used as a chemical blending plant. That effort failed. So just lessons from CERN, and I, was, I had the good fortune last fall during Cybos to um, go tour the facility with actually Rob Plotnick from the DTC is here. Rob and I went, John Lee from TMX. Few of us went and, and toured. And I came away from that experience and this backstory to this wonderful success of being able to, uh, the, these physicists cross country to, to accomplish what they have, um, I was struck by the unconstrained nature of how they pressed forward, that they had a vision and they weren't gonna be encumbered by the questions of, well, what's your throughput today? What's your scale? You can, you know, what you can't do with today's technology was that vision of, we'll figure that out. Let's be unconstrained in, the, in our visions. It was enormously collaborative. So 22 countries getting together, starting really post-World War II, 11 countries in Europe getting together. That was not necessarily a conducive environment uh, to uh, co collaboration and, co and co cooperation, but they did it. Um, it was open. So they were doing things, they were creating things, um, you know, Dr. Connor refer referenced it yesterday, right, the difference between the internet and the World Wide Web. This is where the World Wide Web was, was built, donated. There was a completely open environment in which this technology and uh, science thrived. And they iterated. So I hope, you, you know, from the video you got a glimpse of, they didn't jump straight to the end. They knew they had to iterate. They were building along, along the way. And talent focused, again, it took a, it took a special group to get together. It took the col uh, collaboration and cooperation of a, of a wide talent base. I see this journey as being directly analogous to the one that we're on with blockchain. The vision for what we're trying to achieve, the, the comments earlier around whether it's healthcare, whether it's financial inclusion, there are, there are real things that will actually change the way the world works and lives that's gonna be driven from this fundamental technology of being able to let go of a messaging-based business model where I can't trust your data and you can't trust mine, so we've gotta send data back and forth with each other and agree a view of the world to get anything done. Instead, the ability to share access to data. I see, I see these two journeys as being enormously similar. So where are we now? Um, I don't think we're ground, at the groundbreaking. I don't think we're actually at the, uh, you know, at the initial experiment. I think we're at this tipping point where we're actually really going from experiment into reality. And I think we've heard a few examples yesterday. I think we're gonna hear more examples today. We're working on things. There are lots of announcements. Perry Ann just made a few of them. Um, where real things are starting to happen. I think to, Matt, to, to Matt's point though, um, I, don't, I also don't think that we know everything that's gonna, that's gonna evolve from this. I think it's gonna be massively transformational. Um, the hype curve, right? So you said you, there's a lot of hype ahead of us. I got really, yeah, my stomach twisted when I saw Gartner, when Gartner produced this um, and, I, and I found the blockchain word on it because they'd revised it. Um, I'm, you know, I hate the fact that we're still, <laughs> we're still nearing the top of the hype curve because we have that trough of disillusionment ahead of us. <laughs> And it, we can't ever seem to avoid this with new innovation. So we've got a bit of a rough patch ahead, uh, and we could argue this chart, um, you know, in several different ways. Um, but you know, I think, you know, for me, I think there are pockets of us that are um, are past that, are starting to to ascend it. It's about how do we get the rest of us there again. This is this going back to this point that I my second goal of a frame of reference of understanding where we are. So when I, take, when I think at the most broad levels uh, as to where, in fact, we are, I'm really encouraged for, for these five reasons. We've got um, 
large corporate and enterprises engaged in driving innovation in ways that we, we never have before. If you, I'm a, you know, I've spent the last 20 plus years in financial services, a good, you know, more than half of that in capital markets. If you told me that we were going to get uh, you know, the likes of you know, JP Morgan and Citi and Bank of America and BNY Mellon, we're going to you know, get these large financial institutions together in a room collaborating on anything. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's you know, enormously different today than it was five, six, seven years ago, um, where innovation is coming from these enterprises uh, and corporates, and they're collaborating. We've got a flourishing startup community. So we're in this massive explosive phase of lots of startups, fantastic innovation. It's where the thinking and the ideas are coming from uh, and driving the innovation as well. Um, we've got the large tech companies, so us, IBM, Microsoft, uh, Intel, uh, again, contributing our pieces to what's going to be required to, to bring this all into a production environment and the full spectrum of technology that's going to be required for many of what we, of m much of what we envision. And then, very apropos for today, uh, the, in the conversation uh, that we just, uh, just listened to, the engagement at the government and regulatory perspective is now, I think, hitting a pace. And we're seeing the importance of it. We're seeing the caucus and that, you know, that aspiration of doubling in the next year, I think, is brilliant, right? And we're seeing this globally of the, the governmental and regulatory engagement on this topic and what, uh, what the, the important dialogues are going to be necessary to be able to, again, bring this into reality. And then the consortia, um, you know, as a, as a broad topic, um, you know, two kinds of consortia, and, and again, Matt alluded to this, there's the, there's the technology consortia that are building the underlying platforms or operating systems. Um, so that, you know, Hyperledger, EEA, um, in some respects, uh, you know, Corda. Um, and, and then there are the domain-specific consortia that are, that are now emerging. So Matt mentioned B3i, um, a few others that, uh, that are, are coming out now where really these use cases are coming to life and the collaboration between the parties involved in the business ecosystem uh, are getting together and realizing, to the point that was made earlier this morning, they don't have to worry about their, the destruction of their existing value chain, that actually we can leap past that and there's gonna be ways to make money, there's gonna be ways to be uh, productive and, uh, and relevant through the use of this technology, and Marty said it right, right? It's do well and do good, um, I think is all going to be a driving force as to how this moves forward. So um, I'm a financial services guy. So let me just, again, painting the picture of the state of play, financial services was complicated before this started, right? It's been complicated for a long, long time. Um, I, I love this chart from William Mugiar. Uh, we've blanked it out just for effect, right? So complicated financial services. And when you map into it, the plethora, the explosion of companies that are blockchain focused on that ecosystem is dizzying, right? How possibly can you regulate, think about the laws, think about the standards, think about the, the, the dots that need to get connected when you have this many players thinking about it? Now, so on one hand, this is fantastic. This, this plethora, this explosion of companies thinking and working about uh, uh, blockchain and its possibilities and the vision uh, is fantastic in driving the innovation and the complexity is tough. <laughs> we have to sort, that th you know, sort through that. And so um, this obviously doesn't only apply to financial services. We've heard, you know, we've heard about health, supply chain, transportation, digital rights, government, identity, all of these as critical domains where this is now, uh, you know, this is now cross industry. Um, it's within, in, within each of these industries, and then the most fun I'm having these days is when we have actual the cross-industry use cases. Um, and I, we'll, we could talk more about that over coffee after this. So how do we measure our progress? How is it that we're able to be smart about regulation, smart about policies, smart about standards, smart about making the right connections, um, if we don't really have a great grasp on where we are today, in aggregate, so I'm not talking about any one individual company's progress, but in aggregate, are, who, let's just show hands, who feels as though they've got a handle on the state of play of blockchain as a domain, full stop? 
Andrew, yeah, no, I, that would, there's a few of you I expect to raise the hands. Like, where's, where's Brian? Brian should have raised his hand. <laughs> Maybe he's not in the room. There, you know, there's a small number of folks, I think, that probably could legitimately give a great overview of the state of play. But the, the lack of the rest of us raising our hands, you know, is, I think, is, is our point. And, what, and our invitation and the work that we're working on right now is we're creating a framework to understand where we are as a means to help clarify that agenda, inspire innovation, frankly, um, and, uh, and you know, help, to help to drive us between that gap of uh, you know, the, the current state and the vision. So what is it? So what we are doing uh, through our Accenture Technology Labs, um, we invite in and we've got our strategic alliance partners and then anyone in, anyone in the blockchain space, we invite in to engage with our labs and we take them through a bit of a process. So we have a class of classification framework that we've started that I guarantee you is wrong, <laughs> but it's a start and we're looking for people to help us with it. The classification framework says, let's start to understand none of, not all of these things are the same. Right? There are things that you would argue more, kind of more at the operating system level, things that are more at the middleware level, things that are very focused on business applications, some things that cut across, some things that are focused just on the ledger side of things, some that are thinking more about incorporating the business logic into smart contracts and, the, and going at the processing end of that suite. And so we've got a classification framework that we know is wrong but is a start and we would, again, this is an open invitation to work with us to make it right. Um, what we do then is we've got a whole uh, a, a set of processes and procedures now to do performance testing. So if we, if we can start to articulate what it is, and then we can set the, the functional and non-functional metrics around what, what important parts of performance are relevant as we want to understand this technology. So throughput, scale, confidentiality, et cetera. What are those, what are those metrics? How do we measure them? How do we measure them objectively? So when we're in one domain and talking about it, the needs, how do we compare them objectively to the suite of available tool sets? And how do we understand it differently in a different domain? So the, the needs and requirements of healthcare are gonna be fundamentally different than capital markets, and there'll be a Venn diagram of overlap of some of it. We then have a, a, an approach by which we analyze that performance, those functional capabilities. It all has to be contextually relevant. Right, so it's putting it in the context of the use cases, the, businesses domain, the business domains uh, that, uh, that whoever's building the, is, is building towards. And then this is not about any one individual company's abilities. This is about this end state of an aggregate view where we collectively can say, this is the state of blockchain technology. You know, as everyone's making individual progress, where are we? overall in aggregate, and then what does that mean in terms of what the priorities should be for the next phase? So I, we put in up abstract images just to help convey the messages. Um, there's actually real stuff behind it. <laughs> we would uh, love to, uh, again, as I said, we are inviting everyone in uh, to work with us on this. Uh, this is a concept that has come up in, uh, in all of the consortium. It's a concept that has come up with uh, many of our client conversations, many of our alliance partner conversations. Um, we want to open up this to be a broad dialogue to say we will all be better off if we have a frame of reference to understand how this technology is developing. We offer this out. We look forward to working with you on it. We think this is a critical step to help guide how we turn this fully from experiment into reality. What URL we go to Alisa will distribute that shortly. <laughs> I'm happy to take a couple questions. How am I doing time-wise? I've got five minutes? OK, so we can take a few questions. Yeah, so we, so we will publish uh, through this website the, you know, the, the means to engage, how we engage. And if there are no questions, we'll link up some time. Absolutely. Yeah, no, this is the, the, the value of this framework is, the, the, this framework will be most valuable if it has uh, the more perspectives and that we that get, get fed into it. So, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Where does Accenture stand on the private versus public blockchain? <laughs> so, so I, I, I would, um, 
if you allow me, I'm going to tweak the question a little bit. Um, the, the, I think if we talk about where innovation is happening, there's been an enormous amount of innovation and a, and a, and a source of this innovation that has come out of the permissionless public, full, you know, fully permissionless public space, and that couldn't be more valuable. As it pertains to where we focus our work and what we're doing, we obviously, you know, for who we are as a company, we focus on, focus on corporates and enterprises. And so we bridge the, we're, we, we help, or we're working to bridge this fantastic source of innovation and thinking and making it relevant and useful within a corporate and enterprise domain. Um, you know, that's, you know, th that's actually part and parcel of the charters of Linux Hyperledger and Enterprise Ethereum very consistently to, to do that. So I value them both enormously. Hello, I'm Jonathan Holt from Transcendix. I moderated the session yesterday at the end of the Codathon for lessons learned. And one of the things we discussed was, um, Greg Shannon was there, he previously was at the White House for cybersecurity, and at the, at the NIST meeting, he actually made the important point of trust and trust shifting as the, uh, the blockchain is a, that facilitates that trust. But his, his point was really, it's not about trust, it's about confidence. And what we need to do is actually have a framework for measuring confidence. Yep. Very much like in science, we actually do uh, confidence intervals. So any thought about that, about creating a framework on measuring confidence? Uh, if I understand it correctly, I, I, it's a brilliant topic. And, and the, it's, you know, when, I give my, when I give my blockchain 101 speech of what it is, actually, that, that's the beginning thesis, is, is the, mo that the movement away from messaging-based business models and the, and the state that we've been stuck in for the past 60 years since databases invented, were invented was on that premise. I can't trust your data and you can't trust mine. Your database administrator might have changed something. My business process might run differently than you would expect. A hacker could have broken into either of our sets of data. So we can't trust each other. We couldn't possibly have confidence in being able to point our important systems to your data, right? And so, con so I, I, I buy into that. That is a, I couldn't believe in that concept more. Part of the goal of this framework is to, say, is to articulate what are the, char the characteristics and the important salient features of blockchain that do create that degree of confidence to be able to share access to data? And it's, you know, at the end of the day, right, it's the, it's the, the provenance of the data, it's the tamper-evident nature of it, and, um, uh, and it's the uh, granular level access control to be able to, to go at it, you know, go at data element by data element. For me, putting those three pieces together, talking about the robustness of how all three, how all three of those plus a few others work is at the heart of it. And you know, if we do this right, that confidence factor should emerge from this. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a physician uh, in healthcare, the healthcare space for a blockchain. And uh, I'm a geneticist by training, actually. And, and so what we actually, in, in genetics, uh, is uh, LDTs, laboratory developed tests uh, for the FDA. So try not to get everything pushed through the FDA for authorization. There's actually something called CLIA uh, uh, for certifying labs. And that requires a board special, a specialty to um, be, the lab needs to be directed by uh, someone who's board uh, certified. And so that when you attest to the authenticity of I've mixed these reagents together in my lab, and I've been able to interpret them with my expertise. Uh, there's a new specialty in, in med medicine, it's actually called clinical informatics specialty. So I th in the health IT world, we're actually trying to uh, create that knowledge domain so that there's no like one EHR system that's actually gonna be blessed by the, the FDA or uh, HIT for the ONC. It's really gonna be these domain experts who my reputation is actually on the line. And I actually understand the complexity of how this system is gonna be plugged into my health, my, my EHR, or my uh, hospital. So I think, um, is there a role for certified credentials of, of enabling confidence that the three points you made that I as an expert can actually then uh, attest and be the point person that I've ran these, these analytics on my system and I'm willing to take that on, onus on me to actually to Ver to say that I've, I personally have actually attested to this, um, the confidence. There's a follow-up question. 
Yes, uh, so that's awesome. <laughs> the, the, um, the, uh, the, that's, I would incur, I, I love those kinds of efforts and we work, we've got a number where we're working with folks like that where, you know, instead of, instead of being, instead of jumping to the, um, instead of jumping to how this fits within current laws and, and you know, and the like and, and trying to, to make it work in a particular um, set of rules, Create the, create the capability first, right? So if, if there's a if there's a blockchain based system where you where where you are able to you know take a a a um, reasonable view, you know a, 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 a I'm trying not to use the word confidence, um, but um, to, to be able to attest to your identity, attest to the data that you put into it, have the system open and available for anyone to evaluate and be able to prove to themselves mathematically that no one's tampered with it and can trace it back to its origin as to when you put it there and who you are and, and the, the more we can make that robust, having, running that experiment and developing that capability um, it couldn't be more important to just move further, faster, quickly, and then let's figure out once that not proving that that's very useful. Then figure out how does that fit into the overall framework and um, and work on the approvals and do it in parallel. But you know, it's a, it's it's a fantastic use case. I have a question. <laughs> I can hear you. Uh, I guess you know you, you mentioned it, and the the other questioner mentioned it. There are a number of of countries that are making as much progress and more progress than the United States, and at least one thing they all seem to have in common is digital identity. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the? And I probably would have liked to have asked the our, our uh, regulators or our from the uh, official sector in the previous panel. But what do you think the odds are of a common digital identity in the United States? I um. Yeah, I can't. I can't comment on the odds of, of a single common identifier. Um, I, I think it's a, yeah. I, for all the reasons you asked the question, right? Of the challenges of putting that together, I would go at it slightly differently, actually. And going back to this notion of how innovation is happening, we, we've got we have we have multiple clients that we're working with. I know that others are at, very active in this space. I think Hector talked about it yesterday from a Microsoft perspective. I think what we're going to see is a. Um, you know, as a next major focus, I think we're going to see lots of identity solutions emerge. We're going to see um, enormous innovation in how identity works. Um, I am trying not to, um, uh, yeah, trying not to share something I'm not supposed to share yet. So <laughs> the, there's the enormous innovation that's focused on that. Um, and what I think we're going to see is, is lots of them form. Then there'll be a bit of a consolidation, um, and when you know, again, once successful, I think it'll be then very much uh, easier to think through how does that then, how is that then appropriately applied across domains within business ecosystems in a regulatory construct, in a you know, in a policy and and, and rule construct. Um, you know, I think it has to get built first, prove that it works, uh, and then and then figure out how does it fit within that. Uh, Within the, the laws and regulations, frankly, it's personal. That's how I think it will happen. All right, I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Look forward to working with all of you.